do when an emergency happens. Everyone has their role in keeping each other safe. But do you know how your school will handle an emergency? Teachers and school administrators will work together to create an effective emergency operations plan or EOP that will answer the big question that's on everyone's mind. What's the plan? A key component of emergency planning is creating and maintaining an EOP, a document that outlines how a school will prepare, respond, and recover from an emergency. Lessons learned from school emergencies highlight the importance of preparing school officials and first responders to implement sound planning strategies. Your community is unique. It is as individualized as the print on your thumb. Each of our school districts located across Oklahoma will require a whole community approach when making your school district a safer and more secure place of learning. For more information on EOPs, you can contact the Office of School Safety and Security by either phone or email, or visit our page at the Department of Education website. Hello, my name is Jason Gray. I'm a specialist with the Oklahoma State Department of Education's Office of School Safety and Security. I would like to welcome you to today's webinar, Emergency Operations Planning. We are going to look at 10 key questions when dealing with emergency operation planning. So without further ado, let's dig in. What are some standard components of an EOP and how would I begin to create and or update mine? What a great question to get us started today. This is really the meat and potatoes of what we're going to discuss. We use the RIMS or Readiness and Emergency Management for Schools Guide to Developing High Quality Emergency Operation Plans and pretty much everything that we do. The Guide to Developing High Quality Emergency Operation Plans really lays out three main points is in the structure of it. Um, there's the basic plan, there's the functional annexes, and then there's the threat hazard annexes. So I'm going to talk a little bit more detail about each one. The basic plan is really, it provides an overview of the school's approach to emergency operations before, during, and after an emergency. Your primary audience typically consists of school folks, local emergency officials, and the community as appropriate. Some examples of what could be included in a basic plan are introductory materials, these provide information and accountability with community partners, such as your first responders, your local emergency managers, and public and mental health officials. It's kind of a, you're going to do this, and they're going to do that, and it's all on paper, so we have that accountability factor. The next thing we're going to discuss is organization and assignment of responsibilities. Um, this is an overview of the broad roles and responsibilities of school staff, families, guardians, and community partners. This also lays out how our school or our organization is going to function during all emergencies. The next thing is direction, control, and coordination. Um, this is going to include an ICS or incident command structure. We'll talk a little bit more about that later. Um, that is being used by the school. Um, it also talks about the relationship between the school emergency operation plan and your school district or your community's emergency management team. Training and exercise is something we're all hopefully real familiar with and is an important part of our emergency operation plan. Um, this describes the training and exercise activities the school will use in support of the plan. It also includes core training objectives and the frequency that you're going to do those to ensure that staff, students, faculty, parents when appropriate, and community representatives when appropriate understand their roles, responsibilities, and expectations. And the last piece I'm going to discuss is the plan development and maintenance. This discusses how schools will approach the planning and the assignment of plan development and maintenance responsibilities. These are by no means uh, an all-inclusive list. These are just some that we have chosen to highlight and will be the same for the next two points that we discuss. The next main component um, is our functional annexes. Our functional annexes focus on critical operation functions and the courses of action developed to carry them out. To simplify that a little bit, um, these are going to be actions that we can use in a multitude of situations. For example, an evacuation annex 
which focuses on the courses of action that schools will execute to evacuate school buildings and grounds. We could use an evacuation for a fire. Um, when necessary, we could use it for an intruder, for any hazard that may occur inside the school where we need to get kiddos out. So it's something that we could use in a multitude of emergencies. The next thing I'm gonna discuss is um, lockdown or lockout annexes. Um, we, we really like those words. Um, and I'm going to explain a little bit about them just so everyone is on the same page. Um, lockout is typically we've got no outside entry or exit. Um, there's something going on in our community maybe. Maybe um, the cops are chasing somebody who's robbed a store or something of that nature. So they're not necessarily in our school and, and don't pose an imminent threat, but they could. So we're going to lock everyone out. Teaching and learning still occur. Um, there's just something outside the school that could potentially pose a threat. Lockdown is, is typically something on the inside of the school is posing a threat. Um, a threat is imminent and there is no learning or teaching occurring. Um, if you would like more information, um, we re highly recommend the um, standard response protocol um, from the I love you guys.org foundation. Um, you can go online and check that out. They've got a, real, a lot of really great information um, about that. Uh, the next piece I wanna discuss is shelter in place annex. Um, this fo focuses on the courses of action when students and staff are to remain indoors, perhaps for an extended period of time, because it is safer inside the building or a room than outside. Um, so I'm going to really key off on that, perhaps for an extended period of time, because um, recently within the last year or so, um, we experienced that in Oklahoma. We had a lockdown. There was a situation and uh, approximately seven hours, students and staff were, were inside their rooms. So when you think about those, really think through everything that may occur with a shelter in place. The next thing is the communications and warning annex. This includes communication and coordination during emergencies and disasters, as well as the communication of emergency protocols before an emergency and communication after an emergency. So how are we gonna communicate? Um, during an emergency. What does that look like at our school? Family reunification annex. This details how students will be reunited with their families or guardians. Um, I know a lot of our rural schools, we, we kind of laugh when we talk about this, but it, if, there, if we don't have a plan in place, uh, mom and daddy are coming to the school and they want their kiddos now. So having that plan in place, making sure that our communities understand that plan can help alleviate some of those things. Continuity of Operations Annex describes how a school and district will help ensure that essential functions continue during an emergency and its immediate aftermath. So how are we just gonna keep our school open? We know that during the last couple of years, whether they know it or not, COOP has been on everybody's mind because we've had to figure out how to deal with continuing education in the middle of a pandemic. The last one we're gonna talk about is Recovery Annex. This describes how schools will recover from, from an emergency to include our academic, our physical or buildings, our physical or financial, and our psychological and emotional recovery. So we gotta really look at all four of those and make note of how we're going to deal with each of those. Again, this is not an all-inclusive list. These are just some we chose to highlight. The last component is the threat hazard annex. Um, this describes the courses of action unique to particular threats and hazards. Um, some examples, there's about four of them that really are listed. Again, this is not an all-inclusive list, um, but natural hazards. Um, we all, here in Oklahoma, we face fires, we face tornadoes, um, we face hailstorms, electrical storms, severe storms, all kinds of stuff. So we wanna have plans in place for all of those that, that may affect our school. The next one is technological hazards. Um, cyber security is a big thing, but really just, you know, your elect electricity, um, your water, these are all technological things. What happens if I lose electricity? What happens if well, I know my school doesn't have access to water for a period of time? So how that looks is going to fall under that technological hazards. Biological hazards, unfortunately, we're all too familiar with that currently, um, but not just COVID-19. We also got to look at, you know, flu outbreaks and in the, in, in the history would show that that has been up to this point, one of our big issues. Um, but any biological hazard that may 
may break out at your school. How are we going to address that? And then the last one is human caused threats. Um, this includes ad adversarial or intentional and in incidental threats. Um, so, you know, kids, kids are up playing kickball after school, they break a window, that's probably an incidental threat. Um, but a kid coming onto your school intent to cause harm, that would absolutely be an adversarial threat. So how are we going to deal with each of those? The second half of that question asks, um, how would I begin to create or update my school's emergency operation plan? And I'm going to um, plug our office here. We, have, we are a great resource for schools in Oklahoma to reach out. We'll come out and assist you. Um, we taking that guidance from RIMS TA Center. Um, we're going to help you either get started building if you happen to be a new charter school or, or even a new public school. We can help you get started building that. Um, or if you're an existing school, we'd be more than happy to help you update or, or maintain your current plan. How do schools perform maintenance on the EOP? Performing maintenance on your school emergency operation plan is a key component on keeping it up to date. So we highly recommend that you set up a schedule for annual review. In this annual review, you're going to review and update as necessary. Um, for example, um, railroad come into your district, did a railroad leave your district? Uh, chemical company build in your district? Chemical company leave your district? Um, new roads? Um, anything that may affect uh, the possibility of a threat or hazard in your school, we're going to address and update as necessary. You also want to consider new laws um, that may affect your school emergency operation plan. So recently we had the Riley Boat Ride Act passed. And so we created an annex for that and put in our template. We'll talk a little bit more about later, but you wanna keep up with what's going on legally as well. Another thing to consider are after action reports or debriefs from real life events such as exercises or training. So if I do my fire drills, let's say, and we have a debrief after my fire drills and, and somebody brings up a really great point of a way we could improve our standard operating procedure, uh, we are going to pull out our emergency operation plan and adjust accordingly. So um, that, that may not be annually, that may be uh, quarterly or whatever that looks like just as necessary. Definitely wanna take that time to do that. And lastly, any changes that you do happen to make in any of your reviews, you want to make sure you keep that information current with your community partners. Uh, for example, if you share this with your local law enforcement folks, if you share it with your lo local fire folks, um, you want to make sure when you make those changes, you get that information to them so they have the latest and greatest as well. What resources would you recommend to enhance an existing school EOP? There are lots of really great resources out there for updating your current emergency operation plan. Our office is here. Um, we have lots of really great resources that we're more than happy to share with our schools in the state of Oklahoma. And we also lean heavily on our state and federal partners um, to get the, the best information possible for you. Um, a lot of this also depends on your school communities, your EOP, um, in the Panhandle may look a little bit different than our folks down in the Southeast. And so, you know, what that looks like is going to be determined a lot by your communities, both your school community and your, your greater community outside of your school. So you wanna take advantage of those community partners. Um, you take their information and their expertise, apply it to your emergency operation plan and create the best document for your school. You may also want to discuss crisis communications plan and standard operating procedure within your emergency operation plans. Um, that crisis communication plan goes into greater depth than the, just your standard communications piece in your emergency operation plan. It will speak to um, who's going to speak to media, who's going to be your media relations guy, how are you going to manage the media. Um, if you're looking at ICS and NIMS, National Incident Management stuff, um, what activation levels are you at and how are you going to work with your first responders to make sure everyone's on the same page and we're getting assistance where we need it. Um, it's all about providing the right information to the right people at the right time. Um, and then your standard operating procedures, 
Um, these are just going to give you some greater detail regarding um, the actions that you're going to take to support your emergency operation plan. How do tabletop exercises fit into the planning model? Tabletop exercises can be a great resource in creating, testing, and, and using your emergency operation plan. But you want to do this before a real event occurs. Uh, so just real simplistic in a tabletop exercise, we get a, a bunch of folks. Um, we're going to use school folks. Hopefully you're going to incorporate those community partners such as law enforcement, fire, um, emergency medical services, whatever it looks like for your community. You're going to get those, those folks together in a room around a table and you're going to present a scenario and then we're going to talk, talk through that scenario. Um, you're doing what? I'm doing this. He's doing that. She's doing so forth. And so we can really hammer out the details of of what what our plan looks like and, and ways we can improve it just by simply sitting around the table and having some conversations. Um, we're really testing the plan here. We are not necessarily testing the people, um, although you can come up with some situations and some great uh, points to improve your folks. You're really looking to test that plan at a tabletop exercise. Um, you work your way through this, come up with some really great things. And as we, we briefly discussed earlier, an after action report or a debrief is going to be key in identifying what worked, what could we change, and then taking those suggestions and implementing them into your emergency operation plans. On top of tabletop exercises, you could also implement a functional exercise where we add some, some more people components in. Um, and then if you wanted to take it even further, you can do a full scale exercise where um, we try to add some realism to it and we, we bring in all those community partners. Up. So we may have the fire truck show up, we may have the law enforcement folks show up and we just work through how it's going to look if a real emergency occurred. Um, but the key here in the, in the tabletop exercises is you want to make sure um, that you're getting this taken care of before a, in a real life em emergency was to occur. Is there any particular length or structure that you would recommend? So there's really not a particular length or structure um, that we recommend. Um, we discussed earlier that basic plan, those functional annexes and the threat hazard annexes are important components, um, but how long they are or how they're structured is really up to you. Um, we, we're all about local control. And so we want to, to help you create the plan that is going to be best for your school district. Um, again, we lean on those partners, that guide to developing high quality emergency operation plans, which you can go to the RIMS website and download. Um, is going to give you some great structure, per se, as to how you want to lay out your emergency operation plans. Um, but as far as how long and what's included, um, that's really determined by what your school community and your greater community um, faces on a daily basis or, or possibly faces. So you're really going to want to customize your emergency operation plan to fit your needs. What are some of the most common mistakes or inefficiencies that you notice when planning procedures or protocols? So some of the common mistakes that we see, um, and, and one of the, the first ones that jumped out to me is planning in a vacuum. A lot of times at our, at our rural schools and our smaller schools, um, we're not, we don't have the resources to have a team in place that this is our job. And so um, we either put it on one person, or if you're that administrator, who wants to have his hand in everything, you're gonna to try to do it on your own. I would say that emergency operation planning is best done as a team. It provides different perspective from different areas within your school district. You also wanna ensure that your drills are planned out, are taken serious to the best of your ability. And we have those after actions or debriefs so that we can really um, look at how we're doing our drills and exercises. Are they relevant? Are they being taken serious? And is everyone participating to the best of their ability so that we know what we have when an emergency was to occur? 
Um, it's also a great practice and that you want to integrate your school emergency operation plan um, with your other related plans. Uh, for example, if you're within a city, you'll want to talk to your municipal emergency manager. Uh, maybe you're not in a city or a municipality. You want to talk to your county emergency manager um, and you'll want to work with them to ensure that everyone's plans are on the same page. And the last thing is um, we're probably seeing this a lot with uh, Hurricane Ida, but failure to plan for donations and volunteer management. So uh, Oklahomans love to help and that's a wonderful, awesome thing, uh, but we want to have a plan in place to use that help to the best benefit of everyone involved. Um, so just plan for how we're going to deal with donations. Um, obviously, we want monetary donations, um, but we're going to have other donations that come in as well. I live in Moore. Um, the 2013 tornado wasn't too far from where I live, and it was a, awesome and amazing, the outpouring of support. People were bringing water and just showing up, doing whatever they could to help, um, but having a plan in place to direct those people where they need to go is a great way to ensure that, that we make the most of the help that we can receive in, a, in an emergency. What are the laws in Oklahoma that pertain to school emergency operations planning? So my school administrators are going to be very familiar um, with the law I'm fixing to discuss. There's really only one law. Um, it's taken from Title 63-681. It's a public health and safety school building um, protection from tornadoes and severe weather. Um, I'm going to quote you a couple of lines from it, and then I'll, I'll briefly discuss. But it states that plans shall be reviewed and updated annually as appropriate by each school and administration building and placed on file at each school district and each local emergency response organization within the district. Um, it also states that the plans uh, shall be submitted in a format acceptable to the emergency agency no later than November 1 of each year. Um, so by, by November 1st of each year, these have to be submitted. Um, you will also get your regional accreditation officer come by. Um, that's a part of their list that they will check to ensure that you have an updated emergency operation plan. So not only is it really great um, thing for your school district just to be prepared, um, but it's also a statute thing. So of course, I'm going to recommend that it's of great benefit to engage in preparedness and planning year round. Um, Annually is the minimal, um, but anytime there is uh, something that comes up that can be addressed and make your emergency operation plan better, by all means, pull it, pull it out, update it, let everyone that needs to know know, and then you'll be better prepared. Who should you include in your school safety committee? So our safe school committee is, is another statute piece. Um, it is regulated by law. It states that every year our, our public schools shall establish a safe school committee. It also says that these shall be composed of at least seven members to include teachers, parents of enrolled students, students, and a school official who participates in the investigation of reports of bullying. It says that the committee may also include administrators, school staff, school volunteers, community representatives, and local law enforcement agencies. And lastly, it says the committee shall assist the school board in promoting a positive school climate through planning, implementing, and evaluating effective prevention, readiness, and response strategies. So um, it is statutorily required. So the schools that use their safe school committees, it's a great way to get all those different perspectives um, of threats and hazards that may affect our school and get those points of view implemented into our emergency operation plan when appropriate. How can I utilize my school safety committee in the EOP process? The safe school committee is a great resource to you as administrators or designees who are working with the emergency operation plan of your school. Uh, we recommend including those committee folks as partners in the planning process. Um, we, we use a threat hazard matrix um, that really lays out and becomes a tabletop exercise when we really dig into it. Um, but it, it asks folks to list any of the threats or hazards that a school may face. And then it lays out three categories so that we can prioritize how we're going to address 
um, the given emergency. When we go out to schools to discuss this, I really emphasize taking the big picture perspective of this. We wanna list anything and everything that might occur at our school, and then we wanna come back and address the three questions. Is there training or professional development that you would recommend to enhance our planning procedures? We're gonna recommend taking full advantage of our office's free services to assist you in professional development, as well as working on your emergency operation planning procedures. Um, we offer a lot of really great topics um, when it comes to professional development. And we also offer a six step planning process for your emergency operation plans. I'm gonna go into just a little detail about those. Um, like I said, it's a six step process. The first step is we wanna come and meet you. We call it a meet and greet and a walkthrough. So we wanna sit down and have a conversation with you about your school, about any security safety issues you, you may have um, or things that concern you. We just wanna to get to know you and your school and how you operate and what you're facing. When we do the walkthrough, number one, we're, we're gonna look at things that you're doing. They're really great. We're gonna note those. Um, we're also going to note a few things maybe that we can give you some easy suggestions to improve your preparedness and your safety and security efforts. The second side of doing the walkthrough is that we really want to get to know your school sites and your physical sites, if you will. And so as we're walking through, we're going to make mental notes as well as pencil and paper notes, and we're going to get to know you, your school a little bit better. That way, if you call us, you've got something we can help with. We'll at least have a little bit of knowledge of what you're facing because we've seen your school and walked through. The second step is we're going to introduce you to the National Incident Management System, or NIMS, and the Incident Command System, or ICS. Um, the reason we want to get our educators in the know with this, get them more information, is that this if something occurs at your school, when your first responders show up, this is the language that they're going to speak. This is the framework that they have built their policies and procedures around. And so we're all going to be on the same page and we're all going to speak the same language and we can get assistance where we need it quickly and efficiently. The third step is we're going to talk through that uh, threat hazard matrix that I briefly discussed earlier. Um, we typically like to get your safe school committee together, um, but we're going to do whatever works best for your school district at a given time. Um, we will recommend that if you can't do it while we're there, that you have that conversation with those folks at some point and sit down and go through it. Step four, I'm going to bring out a template that we have created for all Oklahoma public schools. Um, it's very general public, and there's a couple of reasons why we did it this way. The first reason is that we wanted to be able to give it to any school in the state of Oklahoma. And so we know that our schools in the northwest part of the state face a little bit different things than our schools in the northeast part of the state and so forth. So we really wanted to be generic so we could give it to any school. Um, on the flip side of that coin is we also wanted our schools to quote unquote put some skin in the game. And so we wanted to give you a document that you couldn't just sit on the shelf, let it collect dust when your RL comes by, check the box, turn it in to your emergency responder agency and be done with it. You're going to need to take our template and make it yours and make it work for your school district. Step five is we're going to ask that you get your school board buy-in, that executive level folks. And so we're going to ask that you get this approved by that school board. When you get to this point, we're more than happy to show up for that school board meeting, answer any questions that your school board may have. We're also perfectly fine with not coming to that meeting if you prefer. And then lastly, step six, um, we're going to ask you to do that annual maintenance on your emergency operation plan. Also included in the step six is professional development topics. Um, although you do not have to be in the six step process or two step six for us to come do some professional development for you. We have an extensive list of topics on our website. If we don't have your topic that you're needing on your website, please reach out to us. 
we'll find a subject matter expert and get them to you. Um, and again, everything is free of charge and we'll show our website at the end of the presentation. One last note about our template. This is not something that we give you and say best of luck. Uh, we are here to provide support, whether that be information about emergency operation plans. Um, it is a Microsoft Word format. So if you need assistance with that, with it being in Microsoft Word, how to navigate that, we're more than happy to help you out with that. Um, we also um, are constantly updating this. We are currently on version 2.0, working on version 2.1. Um, we started at 1.0, so um, we've added a lot of really great things um, since we've started. We've added a coupe piece. We've added a Riley Boatwright Act piece, and we are continually adding resources in the resource section. So we want to be a resource for you, and we will do everything that we can to assist you in anything related to school safety and security. This webinar has been recorded, and it will be available on our website shortly. That concludes today's webinar. I want to thank you for joining us. We appreciate your time. We also appreciate your feedback. You will be getting an email with a survey, and we would really like your feedback. Um, once you complete that survey, we will send you a certificate of attendance for your professional development records. So with that, again, I appreciate you joining us, and I hope you have a great school year. Mm -hmm.